Welcome to our series number two of RCTV shows about subjects our community is interested in. I'm Linda Phillips, your host. We find ourselves in March with a focus on these, those running for public office, and we're calling these conversations with candidates. Today we have a candidate for the Board of Selectmen open seat, John Arena. John is currently the chair on the Board of Selectmen. John, welcome and thank you for coming by. Why don't you state, start by introducing yourselves to our community for those who don't already know who you are. Well, thank you, Linda, for putting this on. You've done this series uh, with uh, all the members of the board, and I think it's a helpful way to learn more about your elected officials. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I was born in Wakefield. My parents uh, upped the family and moved to Philadelphia, then upstate New York. I went to college in upstate New York, met my wife there, uh, moved back to Massachusetts and moved into the same house I was born in. My grandmother hadn't moved. Um, I'm the second one in my dad's family to go to college. My, my grandparents came from Sicily around the turn of the century. My grandfather became a carpenter. My grandmother became a seamstress. Um, they raised three children. They were in the west end of Boston, right near today's Boston Garden. Um, they're West Enders, if, if, that, uh, if you've heard that term. <laughs> um, they moved to, my parents, my, grand, my parents moved to Wakefield in uh, around the 40s. Uh, my dad got married. I was born in 57. And uh, uh, the rest, as they say, is history. My wife and I have um, raised three children through Reading schools. Uh, Killam, Parker, uh, Reading Municipal High School, uh, onward to Salem State. Northwestern, and my youngest went to Tufts and then University of Illinois. Um, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life is raising my kids. Um, we, my wife and I were very active. We were in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and youth baseball and youth soccer and youth wrestling and then into high school track and soccer. I coached Babe Ruth baseball. Um, I was not a great athlete in high school, but I loved my kids and I knew how to coach. And that's all that was needed. I could keep tabs on them, I could watch their friends, and I could teach them a little bit about being a team. And, and it, was a, it was a blast. Um, when the kids left school, went into college, I began to feel like I had a little bit of spare time. I wasn't willing to spend a moment away from those kids, but everyone's different. Um, but at that moment, I decided to maybe get involved in civics. I joined town meeting, later was appointed to FinCom, and ultimately ran for Board of Selectmen in 2012. Um, Re-elected in, in 2015, and I'm up for election now in 2018. Um, I've enjoyed the time I've spent here in Reading. One of the things I focused on in my second term was long-term strategic thinking. It's easy to think about the next year, but in fact what you really want to think about is what's happening five years and ten years out. Those are the decisions, if made today, will fundamentally change the trajectory of our town in a decade. But the longer you take to make those decisions, the longer it takes to get them done. So my focus for the third term, if I'm so successful, is to get our economic development engine revved up, get our DPW relocated, and focus on growing our commercial base, uh, helping to take, helping to bring in additional commercial property taxes and help to take some of the burden off of our residential uh, property owners. That's going to take time. That's a five or even a ten year project. But the longer it takes to get it started, the longer it takes to get it done. So my job is to get that kicked off and we'll see where it goes from there. I have you raised your hand again if you've been on FinCom, you've been on town meeting? That's uh, a good question. Um, one of the things that this particular office takes is it takes probably two years in the in the role to make sense out of the language, the process, <laughs> the finances. If you've spent time in any kind of um, commercial business, government is very different in the way it does um, purchasing, in the way it does bidding, in the way it does project management. It runs very different because it has to be an open process and that takes time. Um, but it's also foreign. The words are different, the process is different. It just takes a while to get into it and understand uh, what it all makes, what it all means, and how it makes sense. So that first term, at least the first year or two, is kind of a rookie season. Your second term, you're actually able to make sense out of it. It's the second or third or fourth time through. 
I think this time, the difference is we're trying to do some more strategic work that takes multiple years. It's easy to think about next year. I'm thinking about the next five and 10 years in the town of Reading. You know, one of our biggest gaps right now is economic development. We have a, we have a town that's built very different than our neighbors. Reading has 2,000 more children than Stoneham, 1,000 more children than Wakefield, and less, economic, uh, less commercial property than either one of them. So we're in a situation where we have higher expenses and lower revenues to pay for it. And one of the ways to help moderate that is through an effort around uh, economic development. That takes years. It takes years to identify prop, uh, projects, identify parcels, put a plan together, and get it launched. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And in my next term, I'd like to see that happen. We've already talked about plans for the Department of Public Works relocation. And what I hope to do in the next term is get that launched and on its way. And in addition, see us finally get over that 10% in the affordable housing, the subsidized housing inventory, which will finally put an end to unwanted, in some cases, hostile 40Bs. So uh, there's a lot of work to do, and this is all long-range thinking. I didn't think of this six years ago, but now that I'm on the board for, for the six years, it's clear to me we need to think more than a year at a time. Uh, there's a lot on everyone's mind these days. You've been having a lot of coffees with folks throughout the town. What else besides all that caffeine is keeping you awake at night? Well, the hot topic right now, when I, when I visit um, folks in coffee meetings or on the street, the number one question is, what do I think about the override? Um, we obviously had a failed 2006, 2017 override. Um, I feel much better about this one. The number's been moderated. I think the work to, to support the amount that's requested is much more extensive. It's tied to specific sorts of asks, and I think people understand the need for public safety, the need for additional um, support for the for the town accountant, for elder services, for the library, and for the schools. Um, it's all up to the voters, and it's really hard to know. That's the ultimate uh, survey is what the voters think. So I'm very hopeful, and uh, the group at Yes for Reading has done a fantastic job to try to get the message out. They're, I, they're very hard workers, and uh, I wish I had a couple of them on my team. So. Um, how has it been out there talking to um, to the folks who come to see you or that you run into? Do you have a feeling for the pulse of the community? What kind of questions and concerns are folks asking you about beside the potholes? Um, this, it runs the gamut. There are some folks that uh, may not even understand that there's an election in April. Um, after we get past that, we talk about the override. I tend to talk about um, high density housing. I talk about economic development. There's still some lingering frustration about some of the past issues that the town has had, which have long since been put to bed, but the echoes of that are still in people's minds. So you've tried to put that out to bed, but I understand people are still irritated. Um, we are where we are, and the only thing that's going to change where we are is what we do going forward. So. My goal is to try to find a way through the override into next year and, as I said, do some work around the long-range planning for this town. Um, the questions have run the gamut in these meetings. They really have. Um, uh, clearly, there's a, a no sentiment about the override. I've heard that loud and clear, but I do think it's, uh, on the whole, moderated from, um, from a year ago. And, I, again, I'm hopeful that that's positive. Um, and we'll just see what happens on April 3rd. Uh, John, I'd like to ask you, about the Board of Selectmen role in managing high density, high density housing projects. If you could speak to that, since there's a lot of interest in it and your attendance at Selectmen <laughs> meetings have been more than usual lately. So I'm sure folks are very interested in what you have to say about that. Well, they are. So for folks in the audience, um, there is, I'm sure you've seen the large multifamily units, such as the one at South Main Street, uh, Reading Commons, um, 30 Haven Street, you've seen the Archstone Apartments. Those are all what we call high density housing and there's two flavors of that under state law. The differences are important but probably not for this discussion. Under mass state law, towns have to provide a level of support for affordable housing and that's a good goal. There are folks that um, maybe can't afford the price of a, a, a single family home but in the context of a high density format, th they can afford to live in the town. Massachusetts, since 1967, has required towns to achieve a certain level of what's called subsidized housing inventory. The threshold that the, 
town is obligated to get to is 10%. As of this year, Reading is at 9.35%. We are this close to the goal, and the goal is important because when it's achieved, we may say no to future high-density housing projects. Uh, we will have met our obligation. We're one of a relatively small number of towns that has done so, and we should feel proud about what we've done. The issue in my mind with high-density housing has been the way it's been executed. They tend to be larger, 40, 50, 90, 100 units or more per building, and they tend to set down in a neighborhood that isn't really designed necessarily for that kind of density. So you get impacts with traffic, you might have impacts with safety or sidewalks or signaling. You may have impacts with school children, just the number of kids, how they get to school safely. Um, there's also an implication around the impact on our schools if there are children in terms of that additional expense. The role of the Board of Selectmen here is primarily as um, a mediator. We don't have a formal role in the town by law. So-called 40B, Section 40B of the Comprehensive Permit Act, which is one of the two ways that high-density housing is created, goes through the Zoning Board of Appeals only. Um, chapter 40R, or also known as Smart Growth, they sound alike, they're different, goes through the CPDC. Um, both of those groups are perfectly equipped to work with it. Our role can be as a mediator to deal with either disputes or to help bring developers and the neighborhood and, of course, the town interest together. We're fortunate this year and last year to have been recognized by the state for our past work in affordable housing by having it, and, and that has, recognition has come about by virtue of what's called safe harbor status. That allows the town to um, effectively encourage new projects within the safe harbor period to negotiate more effectively, if you will. It essentially allows us to say no temporarily and allow the developer to then recognize that in order to get to yes, he's got to do a better project. That's kind of the simple way to put it. It's more complex than that, but that's, that's kind of a simplified way. Um, we have Safe Harbor. We've had it for a year. We'll have it through February of 2019. And we're making good use of it now in one of the projects over on Eaton and Lakeview. That group is in the middle of a 40B proposal now. And the Safe Harbor is, is one of the reasons that discussion is, I think, going to be very productive. So again, our role is primarily as a, a, a forum for folks to come in and talk. And we can play a mediating role, such as the role that former selectman Kevin Sexton did for the Reading Village 40B on the corner of Prescott and Lincoln. Kevin was successful to get that project reduced by a full story, by some very creative conversations and the addition of an adjacent parcel, allowing the overall project to be spread over a larger area and therefore dropped in height. That's the kind of creative thinking the board can do. We don't play a formal role, but there's a, a strong informal role we can play. He touched on this, um, but the maybe the, the Board of Selectmen role in economic development uh, compared, to, um, compared to other towns, you already mentioned that Stoneham has 2,000 uh, less students than Reading does, and Wakefield has a thousand less. Um, but maybe you could talk to the where most of our revenue comes from, and how we're very different in how we're created, and our situation isn't exactly comparable to to our neighboring communities. Right. So if you think about Reading as a business, you have on one side revenues coming into the town, and on the other side spending going out of the town. On the revenue side, there are two major sources property taxes on residences, property taxes on commercial property. There are a couple other classes, but for the most part, think of it as simply residential and commercial. Reading's commercial segment is quite small. It's only 8% of our total property taxes collected. That's much smaller than, say, Wakefield, and it's much smaller than some of the uh, towns that we call ourselves peers, uh, that we call peers. Um, on the other side, the spending side, because of the greater number of students, we have a disproportionate spend in terms of those school children. We're a bedroom community and we've gotten pretty good at it. We're raising lots of school children and that's fine. But the impact on our spending and on our revenues is much different than a town that would have a greater amount of commercial um, capacity. 
And my objective is to try to grow that commercial segment to the degree we can. We don't have a lot of open land. In fact, it's quite small, less than six-tenths of a percent. So most of our projects are going to be redevelopment, going back and looking at a parcel that either needs to be renovated or it's, it's uh, in a dilapidated state or it's not doesn't have best use. Bring developers in, come up with some creative ideas, and put a better project that's low impact to the neighbors and yet contributes to our uh, commercial property tax bottom line. The secondary benefit of that is the employees that show up at that business in the morning go to get lunch in the afternoon. They may stick around at night and go get drinks or go shopping at one of the local shopping centers. So there's a, an ancillary benefit to the town in terms of the employees of these organizations uh, spending money in our town. That's, that's all a great news story. Right now, most people come to town for Walkersbrook Drive. It tends to be Home Depot or Jordan's or Staples or one of the larger stores. Um, most of our commercial segment is, tends to be smaller stores in properties that are valued, um, although the arithmetic average is 1.6 million, when you take out the contribution of the top six uh, over here at Walkersbrook Drive, the average really drops closer to about a million, a million one. Um, so there tend to be smaller parcels that um, are one or two employees, not very big businesses. We need to do something a little bit bigger to really move the commercial property tax needle. That segues into my next uh, comment or question for you. Uh, can you explain a little bit about the transitional move between uh, DPW, where they are located now, and where they might be in the future? What is kind of an overall plan? Because that's, that's scaring a lot of people as to cost. And maybe you can explain a little bit what that, that's yeah, all about. Th that's another project unto itself. Um, it's too early to call it a plan. It's an idea that's been vetted with um, our, represent our representatives in the State House. And we've gotten, I would call, provisional approval or provisional okay that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the plan, or the proposal, I should say. Um, the concept is to take uh, the property that presently is used by the Department of Public Works, which is behind um, Hallmark Health and behind uh, Bertucci's, across the railroad tracks, and relocate that activity to a parcel in Camp Curtis Gill that would be prepared for their use. In parallel, the town of Wakefield has also provisionally agreed to do the same, so that the two towns would work in conjunction to both relocate their public works activity. When you have two people doing the same thing, you don't need necessarily two sets of tools or two air compressors or two lifts or two of everything. Uh, so you get some economy of scale. You may also have a situation where one of the two is actually better at doing this than the other and chooses to, to perform that service where the other pays for it as a fee. So there'd need to be a build-out somewhere in Camp Curtis Guild of an appropriate size. There'd be a cost to fit that out. None of that's been sized, but it's clearly in, in measured in tens of millions of dollars or more. And it would be split between the two towns. Most likely it would be done with inside the capital plan over a long period of time, 20 or 30 years, so that the loading on a per year basis would be manageable. When the property is vacated, a developer can come in using that parcel, buy it, and potentially consider to make offers for adjacent properties to make a much bigger overall project. And you could imagine that a project on a smaller scale, um, you know, we all understand uh, Marketplace over in Linfield, that was an 18-hole golf course. We don't have that kind of space, but something on a smaller scale, it might be a destination location. Every, um, um, I hesitate to name names, but imagine if you had a Trader Joe's back there. Not, not that they're agreeing to do that, but imagine that you had that. It would suddenly become a destination. That's really the idea, is to put us on the map and allow folks living outside the town to travel to Reading because they want that store, they want that activity. Right now, we get a little bit of that with the other side of Walkersbrook Drive. We're trying to double that if we can and try to make a big dent in the property tax bills, or I should say the property tax collected uh, from the commercial side. I want to edit that. I said that badly. Um, we're trying to encourage more commercial entities to come into the town and boost Reading's overall commercial property tax collected. That'll take some of the pressure off the residential portion, having to pay that 92% of every um, dollar of property tax collected. 
can you explain the different categories uh, between uh, what taxpayers pay for revenue and what commercial property pays, business property? Someone seems to believe that you can uh, have different commercial property can be rated or pay different taxes. Sure. Uh, some of this is governed by Department of Revenue regulations in the state. Um, Reading can have two different tax rates, one for residential rates and one for commercial, industrial, and personal property taxes. Those are three groups, commonly abbreviated CIP, commercial, industrial, and personal property. We've chosen not to do that to date, although last year a small split was instituted to help support senior tax relief. Um, it's a philosophical difference, but a change in commercial tax rates is spread out over the entire class so that the total amount collected remains the same. One side pays more, the other side pays less. Because we're built in a way where it's predominantly smaller businesses, an increase in taxes is probably more felt more vividly or more strongly than, say, at a Home Depot or a larger store that has multiple locations and, in fact, is present across the, the country. Um, there isn't a way under lo state law to have two different tax rates on the commercial side other than one exemption that exists for primary, primarily small sub $1 million entities that have 10 or fewer employees and have other restrictions. When we've looked at that one exemption, fewer than two or three locations in Reading would apply. So in practical terms, there is no way in the town to have a higher rate for large stores and a lower rate for smaller stores other than that which would affect two or three. And again, that, that's probably not enough. Reading has 201 commercial parcels, so we need to do something that would uh, differentiate between the large and the small, and unfortunately, mass law does not allow that. Um, what we can do is something called a commercial, industrial, and personal property shift, where we boost the taxes of the entire class, both the small and the large, at the same time, at the same rate. Obviously, one size doesn't fit all, and since our commercial size is so small, the benefit to residential uh, class is, is, is diluted dramatically. It's 12 to 1 ratio. For every dollar of increase we put on the commercial, you get an 8 cent benefit on the other side. So it, it's a heavy burden to put on commercial properties for a relatively small benefit on the residential. It's a one-year benefit only. And again, it's disproportionately felt by smaller businesses, the majority of which we have here in Reading. I was just going to ask you something, and it just. Um, Sorry, I guess you're going to have right. to edit we can, this. We can, yeah, that's all right. Um, I was going to segue into my question, and I should have wrote it down. Well, I was just going to ask you what if there's anything else you'd like to add to anything that uh, you'd like to um, clarify what you've said or anything else going on that you think would be, uh, you'd be able to provide a good answer for? Yeah. Um, why don't you ask the question formally <laughs> for the tape? Um, um, I'm having a mind blank here. I should have had some coffee. Um, is there anything else, uh, John, that you would like to share with us before we close our segment here today? Well, I, I've enjoyed my time here in Reading as an elected official, and if I'm so fortunate to be elected for a third time, I'd be proud to represent the, the town of Reading. Um, we all know the little child's story about Goldilocks and the three bears. And the, the baby bear said the chair was too small, and the papa bear said that, I guess it was the porridge. The porridge was too cold, the porridge was too hot. But the one in the middle was just right. And I've always felt Reading is a little bit like that. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. And when I was young, somebody else did this job. Now that I've got the time, I'm willing to do it for another term. I, uh, I'm proud of what I do, I'm proud of the work that the board does, and I'd be honored to serve in this capacity for another term. And if I'm so fortunate, you'll have my full attention. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming and sharing your views. And we can put on the screen the uh, best way to reach you, your email address or your telephone, whatever you'd like. 
I'd like to thank RCTV for production assistance today. And I'd like to uh, let you know that we'll ha be having another segment in the next few days coming shortly with those who are running for the school committee to open slots. And uh, we'll be uh, publishing that where you can find it on RCTV or on YouTube. This will be on RCTV and YouTube as well as soon as we, we, um, we edit. Uh, and we'll get it up as soon as we can. We want to thank you for watching, for taking the time to visit with us. And as we said hello, we will say goodbye until next time. Thank you.